I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sarah Pavitt. She did her training at Stanford and had headache fellowship at UCSF and is now the chief of our pediatric headache division. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I have uh, the joy of talking about pediatric migraine today. All right, um, I, from financial disclosures, I sit on an advisory board for Theranica, which is a neuromodulation device, but it won't be relevant for today's topic. By the end of the lecture today, you should be able to list important features of a headache history and physical exam, define diagnostic criteria for primary headache disorders, describe the epidemiology and impact of migraine, and then compare migraine options, treatment options, in pediatric headache care. When I think about approaching a headache patient um, who comes to see me in clinic, I really guide my history and physical exam to truly really try and tease out, is this a primary or secondary headache condition? And this includes looking at every single part of the history and physical that we're trained to do. So it's looking at the timing and onset. Is this acute? Is this has been something that's been going on for years? The different pain characteristics. Associated features. So what other symptoms are occurring when the patient is having a headache? Really important is getting a prior headache history. Oftentimes patients will come in and say, I've never had a headache before. If you kind of probe, no, they've actually been having headaches since they were four or five, and now they're just getting worse. Maybe it's puberty, and that's the thing that's triggering their increase in headache frequency and different associated features. I do a complete review of systems from the neurologic perspective to look at other associated features, along with a systemic review of systems to think about any other secondary conditions that may be contributing. Finally, going through all of your past medical history, really important, assessing family history. Oftentimes, I'm making the diagnosis of migraine in parents during my initial clinic appointment with them. And finally, the physical exam. Most important, we do a full neurologic exam, but the fundoscopic exam is one of those things that should be done in every patient that comes into your clinic with headache. So as I do this history, as I t um, complete the physical, I'm really trying to think in my mind, what are those red flag symptoms that would maybe point me to a secondary headache condition that I'd need to do further imaging? So when I think about that, these are my acute kind of secondary red flags acute onset of headache with worsening pain in a short period of time, worst headache of life or thunderclap headache, which makes you think about a subarachnoid hemorrhage, a positional component to headache, making you think about a CSF, either too much CSF and causing increased intracranial pressure, or a leak causing low pressure, headaches that wake patients from the morning or from sleep or triggered by Valsalva, also a sign of increased ICP, side-locked headaches, which can be a sign of a pituitary abnormality or something like a meningioma, or any focal neurologic deficit. There are, though, some red flag myths that now have really thought to be outdated. So the idea of an occipital headache with the location of the pain. This used to be a red flag that many patients or many providers would um, get imaging for. But they've done large uh, studies in the emergency room looking at patients who've come in solely with occipital, occipital headache. And while they do have increased incidence of abnormal neuroimaging, all patients had an abnormal neurologic exam. So if I'm seeing a patient in clinic with an occipital headache, it makes me take pause. I do a very detailed neurologic exam. And if that exam is normal, it is not a red flag that makes me think we need to pursue head imaging. Headaches with associated cranioautonomic features are another red flag myth. In the 90s, many, many patients were actually um, diagnosed with sinus headaches and were undergoing sinus surgeries 
a lot of studies have been um, going on to figure this out. And really what happened is that migraine is associated with cranioautonomic symptoms, nasal congestion, runny nose. So it's not that the sinus problems were leading to headaches, but they were just having migraines. So even after having sinus surgery, they continue to have these episodic headaches with these associated symptoms. So let's run through a case quickly. This is AJ, she's a 14-year-old female. She has a past medical history of seasonal allergies and asthma, and she's presenting for, to your clinic with a headache evaluation. Headaches have been occurring for the last three months. They started with one headache per week, and now they're increasing in frequency. It's bitemporal pain. Two to three months, episodes a month are severe. They normally start in the morning right upon awakening. She opens her eyes in the morning, and she has a headache. They're associated with photophobia, phonophobia, and nausea. And she's noticed over the last two weeks, not only are they tending to start more in the morning, she's also having associated nausea and some vomiting in the morning right upon awakening. So in this specific case, there are some red flag features. These headaches have been going on for a shorter period of time. They've rapidly increased in frequency. And now you're starting to get some concerning features for increased ICP with headaches starting in the morning upon awakening and nausea and vomiting along with these headaches upon awakening. So with this patient, we end up deciding to get an MRI, which returns normal. So then the question is, what is our diagnosis for this patient? And when I think about primary headache disorders and making diagnoses, our manual is the International Classification of Headache Disorders. We're on our third edition. This website is free. Our classification system is free to download. I encourage you all to do it. If you have any questions on what, where does my patient sit? What diagnosis should I be giving them? This is where you need to go to look up information. So I want to talk about two different primary headache disorders, the most common two. The first, tension type headache. So to make the diagnosis of tension type headache, patients need at least 10 attacks in their life. These headaches last anywhere between 30 minutes to seven days, so they can be incredibly long. And you have to have two plus two. They need to have bilateral pain. It's typically pressing or tightening when you ask the quality of the pain. It's not aggravated by physical activity, and it's mild to moderate pain intensity. I think about these patients as kids who will complain or report headache, and then it, they can still do whatever they want to do in their life. It doesn't slow them down. They don't have to stop doing their activity, but they notice this mild headache. For associated symptoms, it cannot have nausea or vomiting. As soon as you have nausea associated with headache, you can no longer make that diagnosis of tension headache. You can also not have more than one of either photophobia, sensitivity to light, or phonophobia, sensitivity to sound. So only one of those associated symptoms. This is in contrast to the diagnosis of migraine. You need to have five lifetime attacks. Attacks tend to need to be anywhere between two hours and 72 hours, and you need to have two plus one. Pain can be bilateral or unilateral, typically throbbing or pulsating in quality. I often hear it feels like I'm getting hit in the head with a hammer. I feel like my heart is just pounding in my head. It is worsened by activity and moderate to severe in intensity. So these kids aren't able to continue doing what they're doing. They have to come and rest. They need to go inside. They come home from school. For associated symptoms, nausea and or vomiting, and then they have to have photophobia and phonophobia. They need one of these two criteria. This is different than diagnosing adult migraine. I just want to highlight where these differences lie. Kids have shorter headaches. So in adult migraine, they need to be at least four hours. In pediatrics, it's two hours. Oftentimes in children, our pain is bilateral. So kids, it can be bilateral, where in adults, after puberty, we tend to see evolution to more unilateral pain. One of my favorite things is I get to infer the associated symptoms. So if you ask kids, do you feel sensitive to light and sound? Almost all of them are gonna say no. So I don't ask that. I say, what do you wanna do when you get your severe headaches? The majority will say, I wanna go lay down in my room. Are the lights on or off? Oh, they're off. Do you wanna close your door and have things quiet? Yes. If I'm getting 
no, no, I have nothing, nothing. Then I'll, I'll ask some extremes. During a severe headache, would you want to be outside in the bright sun? Oh, no, I could never do that. Would you want to go to a football game or a pep rally or a rock concert? Oh, no, I could never do that. So these are inferred, and it's important in your history to really dig down about these associated symptoms so we can make the correct diagnosis when we're seeing our headache patients. So for our patient case, AJ, who had a normal MRI in that history, her diagnosis is migraine without aura, and she's in an episodic range. So let's talk a little bit about migraine epidemiology in general. Migraine is incredibly common. About 39 million people in the United States have migraine. It is the third most common illness worldwide and the second leading cause of years lost due to disability. This is in adult patients. It's a really under-recognized and underrepresented diagnosis. Um, and when we think about it in the pediatric population, we'll get into this more, it causes significant disability in our children. The overall prevalence is about 12%, and after puberty is much more common in females than males. Before puberty, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. And what about chronic migraine? I hear this all the time. There's no way that my kid could have chronic migraine that's not a childhood disease. That's not true. In adults, about 1% of adults have chronic migraine. In kids 5 to 12 years old, 0.6% and anywhere between 0.8 and 1.8% of adolescents and kids 12 to 17. So these kids, this diagnosis exists. It needs to be identified and treated early. When we look at specifically pediatric migraine disability, we know that children with migraine tend to miss more school and perform more poorly in school than their headache-free peers. We also know that there's a dose effect so for those kids who have more frequent migraine, chronic migraine, they tend to miss more school than their peers with episodic migraine, which again is why it's so important that we start treatment. Nausea is the highest predictor for missing school. And so now in our guidelines, any patient who comes to you with nausea as part of their migraine syndrome, they need to have nausea treatment offered to them. We know that children from socioeconomic disadvantaged backgrounds are four times more likely to have chronic migraine. And chronic migraine in the pediatric population has similar disability to rheumatoid arthritis and pediatric cancer. So let's think a little bit about the pathophysiology. It's a very complex genetic disorder, and it does tend to run in families. There's about 40 genes that have already been identified in migraine, um, and if you have a parent, one parent who has migraine, you're about 50% chance of having migraine yourself. Both parents, that bumps you up anywhere between 60 and 80% chance. When I talk to families, I talk about having that migraine gene, that genetic change, actually makes your nervous system more hypersensitive than someone who doesn't have migraine. It has a harder time processing all the sensory information in our environment. Sounds, light, stress. The migraine brain has a harder time processing that, and when it gets overloaded, it triggers migraine. I'm actually going to skip that part. And when we think about that triggering, so those triggers are cumulative, we have this event, this migraine event, what happens? It's a very complex neurologic process where we see changes and alterations in the vasculature of the brain. That, in turn, releases a neuropeptide called CGRP. Many of you have probably heard commercials about this. It's um, really important right now in the pathophysiology of migraine and a new target for medications. But that CGRP really interacts with the trigeminal nerve, and that nerve talks to the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and cortical regions, which give us all of the symptoms of migraine. I talk about migraine and not about headache because migraine is so much more than a headache. When we think about having a migraine attack, these are the t phases that we tend to think about. There's a predominatory phase where patients will start to experience cravings, yawning, they get fluid retention, and they get this heightened perception. Oftentimes, that may look like sensitivity to light. Why do I all of a sudden feel sensitive to light? This is strange. My migraine is starting. About a third of patients will experience aura, this can be visual changes, sensory changes. You can get weakness. You can get confusion, difficulty speaking. 
And then comes the headache phase. During the headache phase, we tend to see those associated symptoms, nausea, vomiting, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity. We can also get a lot of other focal neurologic deficits. You can get dizziness, vertigo, high-pitched tinnitus. All of these are very common within that headache phase and typically where we see the most disability. Then it comes the post-rome. So this phase of almost complete exhaustion of your body recovering from the attack that it's just experienced. And even interictally, between migraine attacks, patients can still experience symptoms. They can still have some of that light sensitivity. And the, you're sensitive to those triggers. Um, so even in that interictal phase, patients still may be experiencing certain symptoms. When we think about aura, it occurs in about 30% of patients. And to have aura, you actually need to have a symptom, tends to be visual, um, that starts and spreads over time. It has to last at least five minutes and spread. So tends to, I always get the example, is it all of a sudden in your visual field, you're like, hmm, I think I'm seeing a dot in my vision. And then 30 seconds later, oh no, it's definitely there. And then it grows and grows. They tend to be positive symptoms rather than negative symptoms. So paresthesias, seeing rainbows, um, rather than loss of sensation. Visual aura is the most common, and then comes sensory and then language. High frequency primary headache disorders, I want to briefly talk about. Um, so the diagnosis of chronic migraine, making that diagnosis is any patient who's having more than 15 headache days a month for more than three months. And those, you need to have at least eight migraine attacks. Like I said, migraine attacks can be long, and so at least eight discrete attacks with 15 headache days per month. That's in contrast to new daily persistent headache. This is an interesting headache disorder where patients have a remembered onset of headache. And they will tell you, on February 5th, I woke up and my headache pain has been daily and continuous since that time for at least three months. It has not gone away. I've had no pain-free moments. These are really the two primary headache diagnoses that you'll make. Uh, daily chronic headache um, used to be a, a term, and that term is now outdated. Um, and really, these patients will fall into either chronic migraine or new daily persistent headache. So let's talk about migraine treatment and how to think about these patients once you've made that diagnosis. It's really important to screen for any secondary causes that may be increasing our migraine frequency. So when I see these patients, we think about vision and do a vision screen. I screen for obstructive sleep apnea, especially for patients who are having morning headaches. I consider lab work with a CBC, looking at electrolytes and thyroid studies if they have any symptoms. And then I screen for mood disorders um, and really try and establish care for these patients early on Anxiety and depression have higher rates in patients with migraine, and we know that that plays into the pain cycle, um, which Dr. Parker will talk a little bit about in the next talk. Education is incredibly important, not only for patients, but for parents, for schools. The HeadacheReliefGuide.com is a free resource. I give this to all of my patients. They can go, it's interactive. They can learn all about what migraine is. There's videos. They can go and kind of create their own migraine treatment plan. And for medical providers, you can actually make very specific treatment plans based on your patient's demographics. Then I talk about the treatment pyramid, and I'll draw this out for patients. I tell them that the foundation of migraine treatment is really lifestyle regularity, that migraine brain likes things to be regular. And that's regularity in kind of four main domains with sleep, hydration, meals, and exercise. Maintaining adequate sleep can be very difficult, especially in adolescence when circadian rhythms are shifting and naturally teens want to go to bed later and wake up later. Yet many high schools, many middle schools are starting before 8 a.m. So it's fighting against that natural change in sleep. But we talk about maintaining a consistent sleep schedule where actually we know the wake up time is more important than the going to bed time. And I try and say between weekends and weekdays, only two hours different. Hydration, hydration, hydration. 
especially here in Texas, it is so hot. I sometimes won't even give limits. Um, I just give minimum amount of, of water and say, please just keep drinking. And if you're feeling a headache, come on, you're outside, drink a big bottle of water and get into some shade. Avoiding meal skipping. Breakfast is the most commonly skipped meal. So we talk about strategies, workable strategies for patients to incorporate breakfast, something portable, something small, but that migraine brain wants something in your stomach at scheduled times three times a day. And then exercise. There's a really great study done in the adult population where they asked patients with migraine to either exercise 40 minutes for three times a week or take Topamax every single day. Both groups had the same reduction of headache frequency. This shows the importance of exercise and getting out and having moderate exercise multiple times a week. I talk about this not in a sense of blaming a patient and trying to make this um, approachable for them. So if we have areas where we could improve in each one of these domains, pick one or two. Find things that the patient feels motivated to change and start to make those change changes. We then start talking about prevention. When I think about headache prevention, the whole goal is to calm down that hypersensitive brain. And we should really start thinking about this in anyone who's having more than four migraine days per month. We know that when we combine medication therapies with behavioral therapies, it is the most effective treatment for migraine. And I can't overstate this enough that we need to have behavioral therapies for these patients. My approach is to start one medication at a time, and if it's not effective, then we stop it. Um, I sometimes come in and patients will be started on four or five vitamins at a time, and then they're better, but I have no idea what made them better. And each of these still have side effects. So one at a time, and if it's not effective, we change. An adequate trial does take six to eight weeks, and it's important to tell families this. Oftentimes, I'll have families come in and they tried a medicine for three days and they said it didn't work. It's not gonna work in three days, it takes time. And I tell them that our goal is a 50% reduction in their headache frequency in that six to eight weeks. My approach after the CHAMP trial came out, which was a randomized control trial, really trying to assess the efficacy between amitriptyline and topamax, uh, but it was a randomized controlled trial of amitriptyline, topamax, and placebo, and episodic migraineurs, pediatric migraineurs. All three arms saw the same headache reduction. Um, I could spend an hour just talking about that trial and how to interpret it in clinical practice, but what it changed for me is that I first choose a treatment, preventive treatment option that has the closest side effects to placebo as possible. And so in migraine, we're really lucky that we have four nutraceuticals or naturally occurring vitamins that we know, if given every day, help reduce headache frequency. These are the four, melatonin, riboflavin, CoQ10, and magnesium. And I really kind of base which one we go to on the patient's um, age. So can they swallow pills or not? Uh, magnesium and melatonin both come in gummy form. And then other side effects. So are they having any difficulty with sleeping, which melatonin could help? Or are they having constipation where maybe adding magnesium at night could be helpful? Once I try a nutraceutical, I next then tend to move to a pharmacologic agent. And these are considered our first lines with propranolol, amitriptyline, and topiramate. I will say that topiramate is the only FDA-approved migraine preventive in children. It's approved down to 12. So every, um, every other medication that I am uh, speaking about right now is, would be off-label. I just put this up here to show you that there are so many options, and these options are growing for patients. Um, and this is my life. This is what I love to do, is figure out what is the best next treatment option for my patient. So, um, I often will have patients come to me and, and the treatment options are so, are so um, large right now in, in headache medicine. So this is kind of where I view my part in getting involved um, and really figuring out the next best step. So then let's go to the acute therapy. So what to do, what to take when you get a migraine. Acute therapy should be offered for all patients when you make that diagnosis of migraine. Once you make that diagnosis, it should be part of their treatment plan. And we know that when you treat early, it's most effective. 
and I want to encourage you to maximize the dose. I tend to start middle of the road for some of these medications to make sure they're tolerated, but then I increase and maximize the dose based on their weight. I also tell every patient that you need to t try these medications on two to three attacks before we say if they're effective or not. Just because it doesn't work that first time, we need to try it again. In the pediatric population, our guidelines say to start really with an NSAID. And typically I start with an naproxen with anyone who can swallow pills. If we can't swallow pills, the naproxen liquid tastes terrible. Um, so I do not have good compliance with that. So then I do ibuprofen. And then I add on a triptan if that NSAID is not helpful. We have, there's seven different triptans available. Four of them are approved in the pediatric population. Risa triptan is approved down to kids to six. For these ones, trying to think through which one to start, I again think about route. Um, can they swallow pills? Do they have a lot of nausea? So something like a nasal spray would be a better option for those kids. And then anyone with nausea should be given an antiemetic. I typically start with Zofran, an ODT Zofran, and often with these kids who have upfront nausea, I say take your Zofran first, and then take your triptan with your NSAID together. We know that by combining your NSAID and your triptan up front, that's more effective than waiting and doing a stepwise approach with NSAID first and then triptan. I briefly just want to talk about the headache center and the headache program that we have here at Dell, because it truly does take a multidisciplinary team to treat these patients, um, especially patients who have some of the more refractory primary headache disorders. So I feel very lucky to be working with a wonderful group of people. Um, Chelsea White is my nurse practitioner that I work with. I have two amazing pain psychologists, um, Dr. Parker and Dr. Heckler. I also work with a pediatric um, physical therapist who is trained in pain, Bruce Morgan. And then we have an amazing set of coordinators, social works, and, and um, clinic nurses who, who really help to make this program um, wonderful and work for our patients. So we see patients, um, any headache patient under um, 18, and we do a full range of treatment options. So I would say if you've tried a nutraceutical and it's not working, I'd love to see your, I'd love to see these kids. I'd love to see these kids at any point where you're feeling like they need higher level of care. Um, but we do everything. We also do all the neuromodulation options. Um, we do procedures, so occipital nerve blocks as well as Botox and um, patients that would qualify for that. We also have um, access to an infusion center to try and keep kids out of the emergency room and give them the IV medications within the infusion center if needed. We have an interdisciplinary program um, in which patients will meet with myself and then our physical therapist and our psychologist to initiate cognitive behavioral therapy. And then we also have clinical trial opportunities as well as a fellowship um, because I think with any part of medicine training, the next generation is, is incredibly important. So with that, I'd love to take um, any type of questions that you all have. So what is your advice for acute treatment in children that have four or five headaches a week and the threshold for medication overuse headache? Great question. So for those patients, I often, any patient with my chronic headache disorders, we talk about prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, because that is the thing to bring those headaches, that headache frequency down. When I think about what to take as needed, um, I tend to use kind of a variety of options. Ibuprofen, Tylenol, Triptan. So ibuprofen and Tylenol, if you take them more than 15 days a month, can lead to medication overuse. And Triptans need to be limited to nine days a month. Other over-the-counter medications like Excedrin, 10 to 15 days. Naproxen, though, Aleve, because of its longer half-life, they've actually studied it up to nine weeks daily, and it doesn't show that there's any signal for medication overuse headache. So for those patients, I tend, well, for most of my patients, I tend to start with an naproxen because I'm less concerned about that medication overuse component. And oftentimes, if I'm seeing someone with high-frequency headache, I'll actually put them on what I call a naproxen bridge, where I do daily naproxen twice a day for two weeks while that preventive is kicking in to give them some relief 
And as that prevention kicks in, hopefully our headache frequency is also reducing. I do tend to give them a triptan, but we talk a lot about limiting that use to less than nine times a month. And then the other really nice adjunctive therapy is um, either a nerve block or neuromodulation. Um, we haven't seen any concerns for medication overuse with any of our neuromodulation devices. So that's a really nice adjunctive therapy in my patients who I'm concerned about medication overuse. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pavitt. Wonderful talk. Uh, we have a question or a, um, a comment in the chat uh, about CBD oil. Can you speak to that, please? Great. Was, is there a specific or just no, CBD just and migraine? Asking for a comment. So this is a very controversial topic, and it's really interesting. There's a our National um, American Headache Society meeting in June. Most of the program is dedicated to CBD and other psychedelics in headache care and primary headache care. When you look at the literature, it really hasn't proven either way. There are some studies that look like maybe some CBD or THC could be helpful. And if you look at really kind of some basic science models in rats, it looks potentially promising. But there are other more well-designed clinical trials where it didn't look like there were any differences. So my approach right now is that I don't really have any strong recommendations either way. Um, if I have, I will say I have some patients who've tried CBD oil and they feel like that's the thing that's helpful. But I also tell patients, um, anything you put in your body is a medication and anything you put in your body can have side effects. So specifically with CBD oil, I don't have enough information to say that I recommend it. Um, but it's something where if you're trying it, understand that there's side effects. And so we need to be careful about anything that we're putting in our body. There's a question in the back. Welcome. I think I'm going to vibe with Dr. Deputy for the most questions. Um, I have it. three, actually. So my first one is, um, is there any role for ciproheptadine um, in prevention, especially if they've got abdominal symptoms? Yes. Great question. So ciproheptadine, I actually really like for kids under the age of eight. Um, it comes in a liquid, which is really nice. And so in kids under the age of eight is where I tend to use ciproheptadine. Um, in patients with abdominal migraine, that's where actually a lot of the literature comes around for the use of ciproheptadine is all in abdominal migraine. So I use it in patients too who have a lot of those abdominal migraine symptoms. And when you think about the natural evolution of migraine within the pediatric patient, we didn't talk about that today. But before adolescence, pediatric patients tend to have much more prominent nausea and abdominal pain. As they go through puberty is when we tend to see the more kind of what we call common migraine come out with more head pain emerging and that nausea vomiting can kind of subside a little bit. And my second question is a, a role for Toradol shots in the office for when you know, they haven't been able to get control of it with their home products. I think it's a great option. Um, sometimes we need to kind of have this rescue plan for patients. So oftentimes I'll use um, dopaminergic uh, medications, either orally or if you can get toward all injections within your office. I think that's a great option. Um, we feel very lucky that we have access to the infusion center so I can do it from an IV formulation. The one thing I'll say with the Toradol injections is just make sure that you're not doing it too often so we're not running into that medication overuse. Um, the last question is, is that if we need to get somebody to your infusion system uh, center, because usually it's an acute sort of situation, so it's like, you know, to be able to either go from like my office to the infusion center like that day, is there a process for that? That's a great question. Um, right now, the way that that process is working is that we're really having it... Um, reserved for patients who are established within the headache program. But I encourage you, if you have patients who you feel like would be beneficial, the infusion center would be beneficial, don't hesitate to reach out to me, reach out to our clinic. We can get patients in urgently, see them, kind of identify what they need, and get them into that infusion center protocol if we need to. Yeah, send them. I would love to see them in clinic. We can send in the referral. And if there's someone urgent, just call the clinic. I'm happy to speak with 
um, I, anyone in the community about patients that you're concerned about. I've had several families ask me when you're starting a preventive medication, um, especially with the nutraceuticals, how long, because I'll counsel them, you know, it's going to take several weeks before we're sure if this is going to work or not. How long until they might see some effect is a common question I get. Like I think they're looking to see, uh, you know, how, how soon should we abandon ship or add something new? What is the soonest you tend to see a response? Each patient's different. I tell all families six weeks. I say, I don't expect any benefit from until six weeks. If we see something before that, it's wonderful. But just because you don't see something at week three, at week four, week six is where we tend to really see the benefit from it. So on the other side of the equation, if they're doing well, they're meeting their criteria, how long do you treat for? Great, so when do you wean prevention? So that migraine brain, that hypersensitive nervous system, likes things to be stable. So my approach is a really good four to six months on stable prevention until we wean and we challenge. But I tell every family, that's a common question I get, are, am I gonna have to be on this medication forever? My hope is no, and our goal is no. Um, and so once we're at that stable time frame, at six months, four months, depending on how long their headache process had been going and how frequent it had been, then I give everyone a trial to wean off. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.